Hi, welcome to our presentation on electrical injuries. My name is Carol Wolcott. I'm Sybil Wu. I'm Karen Tanaka. I'm Lynn Tai. And I'm Michelle Lee. Enjoy, Enjoy our presentation. presentation. Today we're going to be talking about electrical injuries. And um, first we'd like you to watch this video. <laughs> Yes, life is full of nasty shocks, and they always seem to occur when we least expect them. And once our system has been jolted, the question becomes, Will we survive? Now I'm going to talk a little about the background of it. Adult injuries tend to occur in occupational settings, whilst children tend to be injured in home settings. There's a higher prevalence in males compared to females, this may be due to occupational um, hazards. There are approximately 1,000 deaths per year with a mortality rate of 3 to 5 percent. There's a bimodal distribution occurring in the very young, less than six years old, and then in young working adults. Um, the injury depends on voltage, resistance of tissues, and the current strength. Um, when they go into the ER, most of the time we only know the voltage though. Um, there are two different types of currents. And this is alternating current and direct current. In direct current, this causes a large single muscle contraction where the patient is then um, thrown away from the source. In alternating current, on the other hand, um, it it's an alternating current, which then causes um, muscular tetany. So the patient will grab onto the source if the threshold is reached. So in this way, AC tends to be more dangerous. Also, it is much more common. Um, it's the most common type of electrical um, source in homes and offices. Electrical injuries are divided into high voltage injuries, which is a thousand volts, and low voltage injuries, which is 500 um, to a thousand volts. There is a high rate of morbidity and mortality um, in volts greater than 600. From this chart, you can see that with high voltage injuries, you tend to have um, much worse physical presentations. Um, here, this shows you where there are um, the different current um, milliamps that causes different um, physical injuries. Um, as you can see, the threshold between the sensation or perception of an electrical shock to the let go is very small, and it tends to be even less in children. And so um, the time that they're able to feel that they were electrocuted to being able to let go is a very um, small amount of time. Um, you can see as the current increases, it leads to skeletal muscle tetany and then respiratory muscle paralysis, eventually leading to ventricular fibrillation at only 50 milliamps. Um, 
Um, the different types of electrical injuries are they're split into three different clinical presentations. The first one is direct trauma from the electrical current that um, goes through the body. Um, the second one is trauma from conversion of electrical energy to thermal energy, which is why you, you see frequently um, burns. And thirdly, mechanical effects of the electrical current, such as um, being thrown away from the source or um, loss of consciousness um, leading to a fall. Specifically, the different types of electrical injury are there's direct contact, um, electrical arcs, which are more rare. These are high voltage injuries that can cause thermal and flame burns. Um, flame from the electrical current and finally flash, where heat from a nearby electrical arc causes thermal burns, but the current doesn't actually enter the body. So when a patient first comes into, an, into the ER, it's important to establish the method of injury, type of exposure, such as whether it was high or low voltage, uh, duration of contact, and any concurrent trauma, um, like if there was any loss of consciousness or fall secondary to the injury. Clinical presentation includes arrhythmias, loss of consciousness, orthopedic injuries such as fractures and dislocation, and seizures. So physical exam findings uh, present with a variety of problems. The most common chief complaint is pain. The, some of the organs and systems that are mostly affected are cardiac, respiratory, skin, neurologic, musculoskeletal, and others such as ocular, auditory, vasculature, and GI. So for cardiac injuries, the current running through the thorax is a most concerning outcome. Sudden death due to ventricular fibrillation is most common with low voltage AC. A systole associated with high voltage AC or DC. Myocardial infarction is actually rare and cardiac complications are rare as well. For any respiratory injury, injuries, um, there are due, respiratory, respiratory arrest is due to chest wall muscle paralysis or diaphragm paralysis from tectonic muscle contraction. Injury to, if there was any injury uh, to the head, then it would affect the respiratory control center of the brain, which would also cause respiratory arrest. So skin injuries uh, typically present as burns. Uh, they can be either from direct or indirect contact from the source. Severity depends on voltage, resistance, and duration of contact. Burns on the skin are the most severe sequelae after cardiac arrhythmias. The injuries are most severe at the source and ground contact points. Source is usually at the hand or the head and ground is often at the feet. Direct burns are most common on hands and the head. Types of burns include high voltage electrothermal burns. This is in these types of burns, you'll normally see a contact point. Uh, there will be minimal bleeding, and surface burns do not accurately predict the extent of possible internal injuries, as skin with high re resistance will transmit energy to deeper tissues. And these are often painless and appear depressed with an ischemic center. In arc burns, you'll see a site where the current entered and exited, and they do not occur in low voltage injuries. With these burns, you'll see local erythema to full thickness burns. Contact burns is basically when you see a pattern of contacted items, such as like branding, so your skin is in direct contact with the item. Flash burns are caused by heat from a nearby arc, 
and there is no internal pathway of current so you won't see a source or um, a grounding or exit wound and these tend to be superficial partial thickness burns. Neurologic symptoms um, they can are secondary to blunt trauma or burns. They can be central, peripheral, or both. Transient loss of consciousness is common. Confusion, amnesia, and agitation may also occur. Spinal cord injuries are usually from fractures. Uh, they may have a delayed onset of spinal cord dysfunction. Paresthesias and neuropathy may also occur. Um, paresthesia may be immediate, transient, or delayed in onset and may um, not even appear up to two years after injury. Uh, electrical contact with palm causes medium and ulnar neuropathy more than radial, and extensive peripheral nerve damage may occur with minimal thermal injury. So neurologic impairment occurs in 50% of patients with high voltage injury. For musculoskeletal, um, you can see fractures. Um, they're due to tetanic muscle contraction or associated falls. It may be missed on initial assessment because patient is usually distracted by other injuries such as burns or shock or they're just in just a lot of pain. Compartment syndrome um, usually occur with injuries from 120 volts alternating current or higher and, may, and in order to see compartment syndrome the person have to have maintained contact for longer than a few seconds. Posterior shoulder dislocations are seen, and you can also notice rhabdomyolysis. Other physical exam findings include ocular, uh, such as cataract formation. It can occur weeks to years after injury, so it's important to document any presence or absence of cataracts following the injury. Auditory um, can lead to hearing loss due to um, any damage in the system and it may also develop immediately or develop later. Vasculature, you'll see thrombosis, aneurysm formation. Um, this is usually from tissue necrosis. And in the GI, uh, you'll see a variety of symptoms, anywhere from bowel perforation, hemorrhage, necrosis, and ulcers. The diagnosis is often difficult and delayed. So special population, these are the pediatrics. They're uh, most common in ages younger than six years old. Usually occur at home due to chewing on electrical cords, mostly low voltage arc burns. They often sustain injuries um, in the mouth. And initially, bleeding is not apparent because of the labial artery spasm, thrombosis, and shark formation. Severe bleeding may occur when shar separates, and it happens usually after about five days. And bleeding may occur up to two weeks after injury, so the parents should be educated on that. Any systemic complications are very uncommon, um, but the most rare life complication is life-threatening bleeding due to um, the shar formation detaching from the skin. Here's a list of differential <laughs> diagnosis that should be considered. Okay, so for electrical injury, the workup consists of such. Number one, always check patient's airway, breathing, and circulation. And for all patients, uh, you want to do an ECG on admission in order to assess for cardiac injury or arrhythmia. And like we mentioned earlier, most common rhythms are V-fib with low voltage AC injuries and asystole with high voltage AC injuries. Uh, now, what rhythm shift do we see right here? Yeah, you got it, V-fib. And so after you do your initial ECG, um, cardiac monitoring continuously is not required if all of the following are true. You have a normal ECG, no loss of consciousness, and your injury was a low voltage type, less than 1,000 volts. However, if uh, you need, however, if you if you've had a arrhythmia or evidence of ischemia on your ECG, uh, you have loss of consciousness, or your injury was a high voltage, then cardiac monitoring is required. Now, for asymptomatic patients with no or minor small burns involved in a low voltage event with normal ECG 
you do not need any additional lab tests. However, for symptomatic patients in a high voltage injuries with obvious injury or concerning factors, uh, you need to perform some lab laboratory tests to evaluate for traumatic injury. So for symptomatic patient imaging, you'd want to start with a CT scan of the head. This is indicated in electrical injuries associated with a fall, persistent altered level of consciousness, or abnormal neurological exam. Uh, X-ray or CT of the body would be indicated per se if um, spinal injury is suspected or areas of pain, deformity, or decreased range of motion are found. Uh, ultrasound or CT of the abdomen you would do if you would suspect a GI injury. And you want to evaluate tissue perfusion or muscle necrosis prior to surgery. You could do this with a scintigraphy with technium 99 or MRI with gadolinium. For symptomatic patients um, at risk for conductive injury, arrhythmias, or um, entry exit wounds, uh, which, which are you know, beyond minor cutaneous burns, these labs are recommended. Uh, CBC, electrolytes, BUN, and creatinine, um, those are for patients with minor, with injuries beyond minor cutaneous burns. And also, uh, you want to evaluate for myoglobinuria by doing a urinalysis. And if that comes back positive, you want to do a serum myoglobin. Uh, if you suspect intra-abdominal injury, uh, you should perform liver function tests, amylase lipase, uh, and coag profile. And if surgery is indicated, blood type, uh, type and screen cross-match. Uh, important labs also include serial creatinine kinase blood levels. Peak CK levels predict muscle injury, risk of amputation, mortality, and length of hospital stay. Uh, serum pH uh, should be monitored uh, due to electrolyte imbalances from rhabdomyolysis, which could lead to myoglobinuria. Now, this is just a really great uh, algorithm. It kind of just summarizes everything we've been talking about so far, and uh, you guys can use this for reference in the future. So, pre-hospital care firstly includes scene safety. Any um, emergency personnel or anyone at the scene should make sure that it is first safe to approach the patient. And the patient should be approached as a trauma and cardiac patient. Um, BLS and ACLS guidelines should be followed. C-spine and spinal stabilization should be followed. Um, because spinal fractures can be caused by uh, secondary trauma, such as uh, falls or uh, muscle contractions. Um, CPR uh, should be initiated vigorously and immediately um, in patients with cardiac arrest from electric shock because there may be insignificant tissue damage despite the potential lethal dysrhythmia. In the emergency department, just as with any medical emergency, ABC should be monitored. Um, for severe electrical burns, they should be treated like crush injuries. Um, and it is important to monitor in electrical injuries for compartment syndrome, rhabdomyolysis, and renal failure. Uh, fluid resuscitation should be initiated with normal saline or lactated ringers and this should be um, guided using the Parkland formula, although it's only a rough starting point for fluid management because uh, extensive deep tissue damage uh, may be present even when the cutaneous burns seem limited. So fluid requirements are often greater than predicted by the Parkland formula and physical examination. Um, also, uh, patients with high voltage electrical injuries re require the ongoing care of a burn specialist, which should be initiated as early as possible. Uh, also consider additional consultations with trauma critical care, orthopedics, plastic surgery, or general surgery, depending on the type and severity of the traumatic injuries. Uh, cutaneous injuries, such as burns, should be cleaned and covered with sterile dressings. Um, 
deep burns that are treated locally should be uh, treated with antibiotics. Uh, the tetanus immunization status of the patient should be uh, discovered and high voltage exposure uh, needs transfer to the burn center. Uh, upper extremities should be splinted um, if uh, injury was called by, uh, caused by an electrothermal burn. So elevation is essential and constant neurovascular checks of all extremities um, if there is a fracture, orthopedic intervention in patients is uh, very important and should be done as soon as possible. Myoglobinuria uh, should be monitored and if the patient is found to have this, there should be aggressive IV fluids uh, at a rate of up to 1.5 liters per hour in, adu in an adult. Urinary output goal is one to two milliliters per kilogram per hour. Electrolyte abnormality should be treated, treated um, with things such as sodium bicarb and mannitol. It is important to monitor the serum pH, not the urine pH. Um, and prognostic fasciotomy in 24 hours is indicated if two or greater um, occurs. Myoglobinuria burns greater than 20% of the body and full thickness burns greater than 12% of the body. Uh, GI vis and visceral injuries are rare. You suspect it. You should suspect it when electrical burns of the abdominal area or mechanical trauma is involved. The colon is the most commonly injured visceral organ. Um, you should uh, treat stress ulcers prophylactically with H2 blockers and acids and PPIs. Monitor for ileus, bowel perforation, and hemorrhage. Um, and it can take two to three days post-burn for true extent of visceral injuries to become clear and surgery as appropriate. In the pregnant patient, um, the OB uh, should be cons consulted immediately. At greater than 20 weeks gestation, fetal heart rate and uterine activity should be monitored for at least four hours uh, because of the possibility of mechanical trauma related to the electric shock. Close uh, obst obstetrical follow-up is mandatory if the patient is discharged. Burns can have an adverse effect on a pregnancy because they increase spontaneous uterine activity and affect circulation to the uteroplacental unit secondary to volume shifts. Thus, aggressive care is needed in these cases. In the pediatric patient, uh, there is often severe oral facial burns and, again, monitoring ABCs, admission for airway observation or intervention, surgical and dental consult for splinting, debridement, and possible reconstruction of surgery. Um, outpatient management can be done if the parents seem reliable, educate them on how to control the bleeding, um, because bleeding may occur up to two weeks after injury. Um, saline and hydrogen peroxide rinses are used, gentle swabbing to debride necrotic tissue, topical application of petroleum antibiotic, uh, special consult to prevent deformity and dysfunction is also needed. Also, children uh, with severe injuries should have a surgical consult immediately due to their thinner skin, so debridement and fasciotomy uh, may be indicated. Healthy children, on the other hand, exposed to common household current that are asymptomatic and have no arrhythmias and no severe injuries can be discharged without an ECG or inpatient cardiac monitoring. Inpatient care is required for patients with anything other than minor low voltage injuries. Many patients are admitted to intensive care units with frequent monitoring and rapid interventions when necessary. Cardiac indications for admission include cardiac arrest, chest pain, palpitations, dysrhythmias, abnormal EKG. Patients who sustain low voltage injuries and are otherwise asymptomatic but had a transient arrhythmia or new ST segment changes on EKG should also be admitted and monitored. Any patient who has loss of consciousness, weakness, headaches, paresthesias should also be admitted. Other admission criteria include abdominal pain, vomiting, abnormal neurologic findings, and myoglobinuria. Pa 
Pregnant patients should be admitted for fetal monitoring. And finally, patients who suffer significant burns or traumatic injuries must be admitted with a transfer to a burn center. American Burn Association recommends that all patients with a history of exposure to high voltage electricity and patients with significant burns be transferred to a specialized burn center for further inpatient treatment, surgeries, and extensive occupational and physical rehabilitation. However, the patient should be stabilized before a transfer to a burn center is initiated. Patients exposed to low voltage electrical sources who are otherwise completely asymptomatic with a normal physical exam can often be discharged from the emergency department. Patients with minor burns or mild symptoms can be observed for several hours and discharged if their symptoms resolve and they do not have an elevated CPK or myoglobinuria. Patients should be made aware of possible long-term neurologic, um, neurologic or ocular effects of electrical injury and have follow-up available as needed. Any patient with significant hand burns should be referred to a hand specialist for close follow-up. Patients should be advised to immediately return to the emergency department if they develop chest pain, palpitations, lightheadedness, loss of consciousness, signs or symptoms of wound infection, cold mottled or painful extremities. Complications may occur in many body systems. Dysrhythmias may result in sudden death. Burns may result in scarring or infections that may need further treatment or referral to plastic surgery. The kidneys may start to fail, which may lead to electrolyte imbalances. Extremity injuries may result in compartment syndrome, recurrent shoulder dislocations, amputations, or subsequent rhabdomyolysis. The patient may continue to experience um, altered mental status, seizures, headaches, cognitive impairment, memory and attention problems, or depression. A patient may suffer vision loss due to delayed development of cataracts, corneal burns, retinal detachment. Hearing loss or tinnitus may continue in some patients. And pregnancy complications include spontaneous abortion, intrauterine growth restriction, and the fetus may experience distress or it may even die. And the final complication um, is death. So back to our case scenario, what happened to Edie? Edie experienced a high voltage injury due to power lines and there was direct contact um, during this injury, electricity was conducted through the water that decreased the skin resistance. Physical presentation. Um, ED experienced a systole, loss of consciousness, um, contact point with minimal bleeding, um, deep burns, respiratory arrest, and possible injury secondary to a mechanical fall. In the emergency department, healthcare professionals would order EKG, CPC, electrolytes, BUN, creatinine, urinalysis, serum myoglobin, and a CT of the head. Treatment at the scene pre-hospital treatment and in the emergency department would include C-spine, stabilization, CPR with one milligram of epi, transfer to burn unit or admission to ICU, fluid resuscitation, and burns would be covered with a sterile dressing. And the possible complications of ED's injuries may be dysrhythmia, scarring, infections, renal failure, altered mental status, and ultimately death. That concludes our presentation. Thank you for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Bye.